Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Kidney Disease Education Moment. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we're talking home hemodialysis, something that a lot of people are doing and something that a lot of people don't even know about that option. So to help me unpackage this, I brought on a co-host guest who's real familiar with home dialysis, many years experience, and even worked for Next Stage. Without further ado, bring on Don P. Mormon Edwards. How you doing, Don? Hey, I'm doing great, Steve. How are you today? Pretty good. Thanks for joining us again. I definitely appreciate the times that you come on uh, our shows because you really help us understand the process from a patient's perspective. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's always great to be able to have an opportunity to teach patients about their different treatment options. You got to know your options. Oh, absolutely. So I'm just going to get right into this education moment and, you know, just bounce off for me with what I'm going to talk about. So home hemodialysis like I said, many people do uh, hemodialysis at home. Uh, that's right. And the same type of this type of dialysis is done in center as well. Right, Don? Yes, that's right. But but the difference in home hemodialysis and the dialysis that are in center is the machine. Yes, the machine is completely different. It's patient friendly. And it's not designed for people who have gone through months of training like you all at the dialysis center. It's made for uh, for us patients. It's simple to operate, simple to understand, and it, it doesn't have a lot of bugs in it so that, um, it, you know, it's just really easy to use. And mm -hmm. it gives you good dialysis. Mm -hmm. Can you show us your machine to get the audience an idea what these machines look like? Oh, sure. Okay. We'll, so, we'll wait for you. Okay. So let's see if we can turn it around here. And this is the this is the machine. Okay, so here I'm I'm showing you the top part. This is the cycler. So this is where all of the magic happens. Um, your cartridge goes right up. Oops, sorry. Your cartridge goes right up top into this opening. Okay. And I'll show you the cartridge in a minute. And then down here on the bottom, this is called the Pure Flow. This is your water treatment system. So this hooks up to my bathroom sink. There's a line that goes um, right to the back of this machine and it takes ordinary tap water and it goes through its filtration process and it turns ordinary tap water into 60 liters of uh, sterile dialysate, which I use for my treatment. So I load this bag and I'll turn everything on. And in seven hours, I'll have 60 liters of dialysate. Now, this, um, this here, every time you uh, get ready for treatment, you get a package like this. And this is a brand new dialyzer that you get every time. And this is your patient. This is all your patient line. Everything is in a closed circuit and um, it's already connected. So there's a, a lot less chance for infection because there's no air that's coming into contact with your patient lines. So you disconnect all of this and you drop it right into your drop it right into your machine and um, just like that and you close the door 
connect your saline bag, you spike your saline bag, and you prime your machine. And in 23 minutes, you're pretty much airtight. Um, and you're ready to uh, you're ready to do your hookup. So it takes about, I'd say, a good 40 minutes to hook everything up from start to finish. And then you're ready to get uh, started with your treatment. And again, if you can see the front of the machine, there's only a couple of buttons there. Um, you know, there's not a whole bunch of stuff that you need to worry about pressing and and all of that, um, it, it's just really patient friendly and simple to operate. It, it definitely looks user friendly. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's, it's much smaller than the uh, dialysis machines inside the facilities, correct? Oh, oh yeah, One, if, you, um, if you look at my top and the bottom together, it's still not the size of the machine at the uh, at the dialysis center, and mm -hmm. as you can see, this is right next to my bed. Um, you know, just like a night table. So I do my treatments while I sleep, and um, very rarely I'll get an alarm. But if I get an alarm, you see, I can reach right over while I'm sleeping, and and you know, and press the uh, silence button or correct whatever the issue is. And I go right back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, do um, you have to sleep in a certain position? Uh, actually, no, Steve. Uh, if you're doing your treatments through your arm, um, and you got needles in, I would imagine that you would have to be, you know, pretty careful with um with moving yourself around. There is a different taping technique for um, you know, for when you're doing your needles. And when you're doing a nocturnal treatment uh, to mm -hmm. secure your needles. However, um, I have a catheter and my catheter's in my thigh. So I just go ahead to sleep and there's enough patient line for me to, to turn over and do whatever I need to do while I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. Now, is there an alarm once the treatment is finished that, wakes you up to let you know the treatment has com been completed? Yes, the um, the machine alarms when, when treatment is done. That wakes me up and that lets me know it's time to disconnect. And it takes about uh, five to 10 minutes to disconnect. And mm -hmm. uh, if you have to, um, if you have to hold your sight, uh, you know, you would, you would wait until you finish bleeding and, and, and everything. And and wrap yourself up and you go back to sleep. Can we or you can, get up and start your day? Right. Can we see that filter again? Sure. Okay. So okay. Now, this is the um this is what it this is this is how it comes in your package. Can you push the camera down a little bit? I can't we, okay. okay, right there. Okay. So over to your left, that's the artificial kidney. There it is. Yep. That's your dialyzer. Okay. And you get a fresh one every time. Is it do each do each package have different size? Like is there a standard dialyzer or um depending on the person's body weight, do they have different dialyzer sizes? It, the the dialyzer stays the same. It's the treatment times, the length of treatment, the amount of um the amount of dialysate. Those are the things that vary from patient to patient. But the kidney stays the same. Right. Even if the person was a large, fairly large person that needed a, probably a bigger dialyzer, that would still be sufficient? Yes, that would still be sufficient. The difference would be the amount of time that you stay on the machine and the, amount of, the amount of dialysate that you use. Got but, you. So I'm a pretty big girl. Um, so I do um I do a longer treatment than say somebody that weighs uh I I weigh uh I weigh 82 kilos. Okay. So, so I do a uh six hour and fifteen minute treatment um on uh four days a week. Now somebody okay. somebody else may only have 
uh, maybe a five a five hour treatment. Or if you're doing short daily dialysis, maybe you'll only have a two and a half to a three hour treatment. Mm-hmm. You know, How- so it all everybody's everybody's prescription is is tailored to them specifically. Uh-huh. How long does it take you to set that up to get ready for your treatment? It takes me it takes 23 minutes to prime and then the uh, the entire setup from start to finish is about 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So say if, if, if a warrior is watching right now that wanted to do home dialysis and they live by themselves, uh, do you do this by yourself? I know the last time we talked, you said your mom stays there with you. And if you ran into trouble that she can help. But right. now I heard that the regulations has changed, that people are able to do the treatment at home unassisted. That's correct. And that's, it's a wonderful thing. It's given so much freedom to a lot of patients because the FDA has uh, approved uh, last year, they've approved solo dialysis. So that means that people can do the um, use a next stage machine um, without a partner, but only during waking hours. So it's not approved for nocturnal dialysis. You still need someone in the house with you when you're doing an overnight treatment. But if you mm-hmm. want to do the short, the shorter daily treatment, um, you can do that with uh, with no one in the house. Mm-hmm. Can you <clears throat> do you have a, a area where you weigh yourself? Yes. They can provide, we see that? They provide you with everything that you need. Um, you get your own bl- blood pressure machine. You get your scale, and I'm going to show you my scale right now. There's my scale. Okay. And, and I, I have my uh, my own blood pressure machine. Where you is get, that at? Uh, boy, Steve, you didn't tell me to get all this stuff together. Oh, no, here's, I'm sorry. No, you don't have to my, get it. Here's my stethoscope for my, um, you know, to to uh, listen to your access. You're supposed to check that every treatment. So you have your stethoscope. Here's my emergency kit that you should always have your emergency uh, takeoff kit. And what's inside that kit? Okay, inside here we have some heparin. We have um, we have clamps. There's mm-hmm. the flashlight that, that doesn't require batteries. Um, Have you ever had to use that kit before? No, I, I never had to use the emergency takeoff kit. I did have to use the flashlight a couple of times. We lost some power uh, up here, you know, due to a storm or or something like that. So I did need to use my um, use my flashlight so that I could disconnect from the machine. But I've never had to do like a cut and clamp or anything like that. And being that it's right in my bedroom, all of my supplies are right here next to me. So I can just reach over and grab what I need. So Mm -hmm. to, to disconnect yourself from the machine is so quick and easy. You, it's just like a clamp of your two lines and, um, you know, and, and really basically unscrewing yourself and putting your caps on. Mm-hmm. Now, do you keep a record of your of your treatment while you're sleeping or the machine automatically does that for you? No, actually, what you do, what you have is we have a flow sheet and it's probably similar to the one that you would use at the unit. Here's my flow sheet. So. Now, when you're doing a nocturnal treatment, all you have to do is um, you take one set of vitals when you go on and one when you come off because your blood pressures and your stats and and your vitals don't really change while you're sleeping. Sometimes I get the same blood pressure when I go on, you know, as I get when I come off. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you're doing your, you know, your, your awaking hours treatment, every half an hour, you should be taking your vitals, just like in the dialysis center. Mm-hmm. So now, 
You does, does, does this help you sleep at night? Actually, I have to tell everybody, um, doing your dialysis treatments to, it, at home, it does help me sleep better at night because I'm getting such a, such a good treatment. I'm getting better clearances and I do sleep better. Uh huh. Now, Stephanie Dixon asked, um, how much does all this cost? It doesn't cost one cent. If you're covered for, uh, you're covered by Medicare for your dialysis treatments in center, Medicare covers you to go home. Um, Donna, we have another question. Donna asked, uh, did you personally buy the machine? Nope, I didn't have to buy a thing. The dialysis center provides everything that you need. Wow. Yeah, so you, you don't have to pay for, for, you don't pay for anything. Just mm -hmm. like the, just like your, all of your medications and your supplies are provided to you at the dialysis center. It's the same thing when you go home. So my medications that I take, like the Epigen and the Venifer, all, mm -hmm. of that, all of that comes to my house and I administer that to myself. Right. Um, what would you say to the person who's watching this right now in another state or just somewhere watching that's interested in doing home dialysis and they don't offer it at their clinic where they go? How would they be able to do it if they don't offer it at their facility? What I tell dialysis patients is you have to think about yourself first. Um, don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to move. If they don't offer it at the center that you're going to, then you go to a center that offers it. You can go to Home Dialysis Central and they have they you can put in your zip code and they will give you a list of dialysis centers where you can go to get the type of dialysis that you're looking for. If it's not home hemodialysis, you can look up a dialysis center that offers peritoneal dialysis. Also, mm -hmm. um, the CMS, the Medicare website has a feature called Dialysis Facility Compare. And you go to uh, the Medicare website, you put in your zip code, and you can look up a dialysis facility based on the criteria that you're looking for. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for a facility within 10 miles of your house that offers home hemodialysis, you can do a search for that. Or mm -hmm. if you're looking for peritoneal dialysis, you can do a search for that. So mm -hmm. that's on the Medicare website and it's called Dialysis Facility Compare. You in New York, right? Yes. In Queens? Yes, I'm in Jamaica, New York. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, what other supplies do you have to use when you're doing home dialysis? You showed us the machine, the scale, the blood pressure cup, the emergency takeoff. Right. Um, are there any other, like a catheter kit that you have to use? Okay. So I put all of my supplies together myself. And they send me what I need, like chucks. Um, you know, here's my chucks so that I can, um, you know, use to put my right. supplies on. And over here is where I have all of my other ancillary supplies. Got for, you. For example, um, I and s since we're talking about that, I use something that's really great. If anybody has a catheter, um, I know that catheters are not the suggested um, vascular access, but some people don't have a choice. After 27 years of dialysis, um, my vascular system is, is not in the greatest condition. So I have a catheter and my nurse got me something called Curo's caps. And I'm going to show it to you now. These go on the tip of your catheter and it's airtight so that um, it, 
prohibits bacteria from getting inside your catheter. Mm-hmm. And you change those, uh, you change them like every three or four days. And I haven't had an infection since I started using these. Mm-hmm. And some people are concerned about chlorhexidine. They're um, allergic to it. But these particular uh, caps, these this is called a Tago. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Tago. Tago. I was trying to think of it. We, right. I use them. And uh, let me just, I, I believe the main reason why they switched to them because you don't have to put heparin inside the catheter. That's how they save on the heparin. Because at one time we used to flush the catheter uh, with normal saline and then pack it with two with cc's. The- of heparin, of, right. Of heparin. Now with that, you don't have to use that because of the back valve that's, that's in the right. top of that. And, it, you know, that's another way of them saving money on putting heparin in the uh, catheters. That's You're my right. that's just my opinion. And that may not be what they tell you, but. Right. That's well, you what, know, there, there, there's definitely two reasons. You don't have to put heparin in there. But there's also, if you take a look, if you can look inside, you can't get, you can't get anything in there unless you, unless you're pushing something in here. Exactly. You know, so it, it does help with mm-hmm. keeping the infection, you know, out of that, um, you know, out of that top of the catheter. Mm-hmm. And then on top of this, we use the Curo caps and this is, um, this is a little cap. And little small white ones. Right. There you go. And it has alcohol in it. So okay. This, you know, these real, I haven't had an infection since I started using these. Mm. Do so you take showers I, with the catheter? I don't. Because just for simple, you know, just simply put, because my catheter's in my thigh. And it's just, it's just really, I'm afraid of getting some, um, you know, some water or something, you know, in that area, in that mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. If I, when I had the chest catheter, I did, t- I did shower. Mm-hmm. However, with, um, with the area that I have it in now, I just avoid that out of, you know, out of fear of bacteria. Mm-hmm. So can you, can, can you come back on for a moment? Okay, sure. Sure. Hey, Dor, how you doing? I might as well say hi to my Stephanie while while I'm getting myself set back up. I'm glad Stephanie Dixon's watching. That's my buddy. Okay. There you go. So, great. Thank you for for showing us that, Don. That was really a great education moment. Um, We had a question from Rick. He wanted to know, which is better, PD or hemo? I know that's one's opinion, but from your perspective, being that you did both, I believe. Yes, I did. In your history, yes. what would you consider to be the most best that you done? Okay, I, I, it all depends on what you're looking for and what your medical needs are. As a patient, um, I would say that home hemodialysis gives you the best outcomes um, as far as clearance and as far as toxins removal and, and all of that, that I get the best dialysis that I ever got from home hemodialysis. Now, when we want to talk about convenience and what's the easiest to do and, um, you know, I, then I would say peritoneal dialysis would be my choice for that. However, yeah. I didn't feel as good when I was on peritoneal dialysis that as I do now that I'm doing home hemodialysis. But mm-hmm. for e- ease of traveling, um, you take your peritoneal dialysis machine is not as heavy as this home dialysis machine. Um, and as far as setting up and all of that, peritoneal dialysis is much easier to do. However, you're not get you're not getting 
as good of a toxin removal as you get with home hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. Now, how long does it take you to clean your machine and disinfect it? Okay, and that's another great thing about home hemo. Um, once I'm done with my treatment, that entire cartridge that I showed you, I take that out of the machine, roll it up, and throw it in regular trash. Um, it doesn't have to go in a special biohazard or red bag? No. It go, I double. I use two garbage bags, and I double bag, and I throw it right in the regular garbage, and I use Clorox wipes, Clorox wipes, to wipe the outside of the machine because nothing comes into contact with the inside of that machine. So I wipe that machine down with, with Clorox wipes and that's it. Now, what's so different other than the volume of bloodlines between the dialysis unit and you throwing the um, discarded lines in the regular <laughs> trash? Well, once you rinse back, Steve, um, you use about, um, you use uh, almost 300 um, milliliters of saline to rinse back. And once you rinse back, those lines are pretty much clear. And there's not mm -hmm. enough, there's not enough blood contained in the, in the blood lines and the dialyzer to constitute needing to go to the, um, go to special trash. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. So what what convinced you to do whole hemodialysis in the first place? Well, when I came back from my kidney transplant, um, I was in I was in really bad shape. I had lost my um, lost the function of my colon. I had the early stages of colon cancer and I had to have my colon removed. So that abdominal surgery uh, prohibited me from going back to peritoneal dialysis. Um, if I could have, I would have gone back to peritoneal dialysis, but um, I definitely didn't want to be in center and I had to go home. And um, so I gave next stage a try and um, little did I know that I was going to be getting some really great dialysis and that I was going to be feeling um, almost as good, if not better than I did when I had my kidney transplant. And people people don't believe it when I say that, but the dialysis that you get from home hemodialysis, it, um, you feel uh, about as good, if not better than when you have your kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have any hesitations in the beginning, like who was going to help you and how were you going to do this? Was there any hesitations in the beginning when you first started? I think there's always the fear of the unknown. Um, however, being that I had done peritoneal dialysis for 10 years prior mm. to, you know, prior to my kidney transplant, I wasn't really afraid of administering my own treatment. Um, I wanted to go home. So I was enthusiastic about going to training and learning how to do my own treatment. I, I had already developed a sense of independence. Mm -hmm. So I was excited about going home. I wanted to learn how to do it myself so that I could go home. And I think I'm just one of those people that is is just really independent. And now if you tell me anything about going to the dialysis center, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking and screaming because I don't, I don't have any desire to um, have anybody do my dialysis for me anymore. Have, have you ever done in-center dialysis? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. My first, my first three years were spent doing in-center dialysis and I hated it. Um, I hated every treatment, and um, actually, I had considered uh, withdrawing from dialysis completely because I was 23 years old, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. What did you hate about it? 
Um, well, there were several things. I started dialysis back in the 90s, which was back in, uh, in, in the, it was just a huge drug epidemic going on. And I think I got traumatized by a lot of the things that I saw in the dialysis center. I saw a lot of patients cold and that scared me to death. Um, and then I used to see drug addicts that would come to dialysis treatment and shoot dope into their um, mm. into their venous lines. And Steve, I know you remember this because you've been in dialysis a long time. Remember when you used to be able to shoot medicine into your venous line? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really ironic that you said that because I worked at a facility in Baltimore City back in the 90s. And I was just talking to somebody about this the other day that there used to be patients that go inside. The unit had a bathroom. and It was a 30 chair unit located uh -huh. inside a medical building. So it had a restroom inside the facility and then it had a restroom out in the hallway. Okay. And people used to get off the machine said they had to go to the bathroom and go out in the hallway to the bathroom and smoke crack inside wow. the bathroom or, you know, shoot up. And like you said, in the lines and, and even when some people went home, you come back and when we work with the catheters and we can see, you know, where it's been tampered with. So, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that does happen. A lot of people who may not say it doesn't happen to their units in a lot of the urban facilities in the inner city units, it does happen. I've seen patients come to treatment. Uh, the, the dialysis unit is right across the street from the liquor store and a gentleman coming to treatment. I mean, he's drunk. I mean, yeah. when I say drunk, he don't have a buzz. He's drunk and coming in and you know, staying on the machine for an hour and a half and getting off and, and going out to the uh, patient lobby and sleeping, stuff like that. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. Right. And, and you know, stuff like that. I was 23 when I started dialysis. So, I mean, that it just traumatized me, Steve. And I just, I didn't want, I couldn't stand that environment. Um, the patients would get high and you know how they go into that dope nod and, you know, and it, it, it was just too much. It was too much. And, I'm sure. I'm and sure. Then, and then I've seen way too many patients die, die on the machine for my taste. Mm. You know, and back mm. in the 90s, that was happening a lot more regularly than it is now. Wow. So now I associate the dialysis center with that trauma from back then. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. I just feel much more comfortable doing my own treatments. I know how clean my hands are. You know, I know that I wash my hands and I know my technique and I'm familiar with taking care of myself and I'm satisfied with the treatment that I give myself. Mm -hmm. Now, your electrical outlet, did you need a special outlet for your machine? No. Um, it, I plug right into the um, the electrical outlet. Um, I did buy that little grounded uh, the grounded adapter that goes mm -hmm. on, and that's just you know just for uh, for my own safety because my because I live in an old house. But um, you don't need to do anything special to your house um, to hook up to the water. You can screw it right into a um, a sink faucet, or you can do the under the sink method, like the washing machine. So but, you um, you have a drain that your your lines go into. Yes, I have a drain line. So it goes into the bathroom. Is it a That's, bathroom in your room? It's it's a bathroom right down the hall. And being that I being that I live in a house, we had somebody come and just run the lines under the floor. You know, and um, so that was simple for me. But you you don't have to do it that way. Um, you can run that line just like a peritoneal dialysis machine. You can run that line right into the toilet bowl. Mm, mm hmm. Absolutely. So people, absolutely, people are concerned about making revisions to your house and things like that. 
um, that's, that doesn't even have to be a concern. And a lot of facilities will send a technician out to hook up your machine and, and hook up everything for you so that that doesn't have to be a concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So have you had any challenges in all the years doing this with home dialysis? Um, I, I, I can say um, the, the real challenge that I could say that I personally have is sometimes I get tired of you know, doing everything myself. Um, it, 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 it can, it, it can burn you out, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, but, um, I call my nurse when I'm feeling that way and let her know that, you know, I feel like I need a little break and, um, it, she'll fit me into the schedule and I can go into the dialysis center and she'll set up my treatments and she'll treat me in the training room. So that's called respite care. And, you know, everybody, do, everybody doesn't want to do that. But, you know, it, it's nice to know that I can get some help if I need it. Mm -hmm. And um, I've gone back in, in uh, and it's not in, in the dialysis unit. It's in the training room, in the home dialysis um, training area. So I'm mm -hmm. not back in regular population with everybody else. It's in the training room. And I've done that for um, sometimes two weeks just to get mm -hmm. a break. Right, right. Well, and also, could you also maybe say, for instance, like take a break, to, like delaying your treatment, like instead of doing it, to say, for instance, if you had to do it tonight, instead of doing it tonight, you do it tomorrow night. Yes. Or Oh, I do that all the time. <laughs> you know what? Home dialysis is made to fit your lifestyle. And that's one of the great things about being in a home dialysis, dialysis program. Um, one of the things that my nurse did was she sat down with me and she asked me, what kind of things do you like to do? Um, or what were my goals? And when she asked me that, I thought that that was the craziest question in the world because I'm on dialysis. What do you mean goals? You know, I want to live. That's about it. But she wanted to know, do I have hobbies? Do I have things that I like to do? And I like to go to church on Sunday and Sunday afternoon is family time. So I don't want to do dialysis on Sunday, you know? So or if I'm going out on Saturday night, and I don't want to do treatment on Saturday night, then I can do my treatment on Sunday night. Or I can, you know, it. it's made to fit into your lifestyle. And you mm -hmm. don't have to do it the same time every, you know, every treatment. So if I go on, on you know, on treatment, I can go on 10 o'clock one night, 1230, 130. Sometimes I've got on the machine four o'clock in the morning because that's when I got home. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's it's made to suit your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Now, I, you know, no, I'm sorry, so, go ahead. You know, I go to work. So I um, you know, I do my dialysis treatments while I'm sleeping so that the rest of the day can belong to me. So let me ask you, in your opinion, who would you say be eligible for doing home dialysis? Is there any type of criteria? The only criteria that I would really say is you have to want to do it. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, and you have to commit yourself to doing your treatments, um, filling out your flow sheets, faxing them in, you know, just a sense of responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that there is a little Medicaid problem with home hemodialysis. Um, however, peritoneal dialysis, um, you know, any, anybody can, anybody can do it as long as you don't have problems with your hands, uh, your hand and eye coordination and being able to use your fingers, you know, to, um, you know, to screw the, screw the lines together and everything and cannulating yourself. Let me tell you. Uh, people think that that's the biggest, you know, that that's the biggest problem. And that was one of the easiest things to do because you can feel your own access. 
So you can tell when you got it or not. Mm -hmm. And mm. um, when, when I do use my graft, I have the Emla cream, and you put that on an hour before treatment and wrap it up, and you don't feel that needle going in at all. Only mm -hmm. thing you feel is when you got it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, someone who's watching right now who's, let's just say they had a, uh, a mom or a dad that just got diagnosed with yes. kidney failure and these people have time on their hands would you think it may be in their best interest for them to consider home dialysis to help their parents because it would kind of reduce them of, of, of transporting uh, right. their parent to dialysis their transportation their whole weight because that seems to be a challenge for a lot of people as well is transportation to and from dialysis. And I, I think home dialysis would be a good fit for people who, who do, like you say, able to take responsibility of their own health. And for say baby boomers who have parents who with, with kidney disease that have an extra room and that could take the time to do this for their parents at home, this can reduce, like I said, driving to the unit. Right. Uh, it, could, it could reduce a lot of uh, time and effort, uh, uh, extra um, maybe 12 to 15 hours a week, depending on how long their, their parent or someone is on dialysis. That's right. And I, I say that to anyone. Um, I think that doing treatments at home gives you back so much of your life and so much of your time. Um, we don't realize how much time we spend going back and forward to dialysis treatments or getting up in weather like this. Look at, look at the weather that we have going on in the country now with these sub-zero temperatures. Who wants to get up and get dressed going out to dialysis and, and you see me right now. I'm in my pajamas right now, you know, and um, I, I'm ready to ready to do treatment tonight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's a huge convenience. Not, not even, we're not even talking about the clinical benefits of doing your treatments at home. We're talking about time and we're talking about effort. Um, if, if you can do your treatments at home, I, I would, I think that it's empowering to do your treatments at home. Mm -hmm. Greg, we're talking about home hemo, uh, not PD, but PD is, is also, um, it's just as awesome, but yes, but where this particular topic is home hemo. And so, uh, Don, yes. speaking of, um, you saying the convenience of it, I was just thinking, even during the holiday schedule, Christmas and New Year's, when units change their schedule around and sometimes cut patients' treatments to accommodate the staff. Yes. Um, and that doesn't have to happen in home hemo. You don't have to get your treatment cut. You don't have to uh, change your schedule because of Christmas. You don't have to come on Sunday. Which right which throws a lot of people off during right. the holiday season when they have to get their treatment on Sunday, especially if they worship on Sunday, right. then they got to rearrange their schedule. So home, it just seems like home hemo would be the best option. And, and let me ask you this, Don. Yes. I know you, you live in New York and you said you had a house. What about the person who lives, um, maybe public housing or an apartment, would this be um, suitable for them as well? You know, Steve, just like this machine fits next to my bed in a house, it can fit next to your bed in, a, in an apartment. And like I said, there's, you don't have to make any adjustments to your apartment. You can run that drain line you know, I, I know plenty of patients that live right in, in um, New York City public housing that do their treatments at home. Wow. 
And, yeah. and again, you said you do this while you're sleeping, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you ever awake when when it's done? Sometimes. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm awake. I'm awake sometimes. Um, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, I I can change my schedule around and say, you know, I wanna I, I wanna do these short the shorter daytime treatments. I that I can change my schedule. You know, as long as as long as my nurse agrees with me, I can do my treatments five days a week for three and a half hours. So pretty much you have control of your treatment, whether you talk to your nurse or not. You can. I mean, we and let me just make a disclaimer here. If you're doing home dialysis, we're not saying change your treatment around um, or anything like that. Always seek the. Uh, advice of your PD nurse or your home hemo nurse and your physician. Right. But what what I'm hearing though is pretty much technically you don't have to call her to tell you that you're going to do dialysis or a short dialysis. You can just do that technically, but out of respect and consideration, you're going to let her know so she could be on the same page of what type of treatment you're doing in case maybe your labs may come back a little different than what they normally use usually be. Now, what I don't, what, what we don't do is you don't switch back and forth from nocturnal to daytime. Um, okay. That, that you don't do without your, without letting your, um, your team know. Um, okay. However, ha and they don't like for you to, go um two days in a row without treatment okay so, got you you know so i wouldn't just go away for the weekend and say i'm not doing treatment you know without you know with without talking to my care team mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i'm i'm responsible for four nocturnal treatments a week okay and if i do i now generally speaking i do my treatments on um on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But if something comes up during the week and I need to adjust those days, as long as I'm getting my four days in, then, you know, then I'm in good shape. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's basically your, you know, that's your responsibility. You get your treatments in. And, you know, you send your evidence in and the evidence of you doing your treatment is the fax in your flow sheets. You have a fax machine at home? Yes, they provide you with that as well. Wow. Correct. So they make it really convenient for you to do this at home. Yes. And, and this, is, this is a whole huge initiative on the, on the part of Medicare now. Um, you know, I, we talked about this offline, but only 8% of our dialysis population does their dialysis treatments at home. So that means that 92% of people who um, require dialysis are doing their treatments in the dialysis center. And that's mm -hmm. costing Medicare a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Hey, Don. Yes. We had a question from, uh -huh. uh, from Willie Bottoms out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. He wants to know when the state comes into the facilities and audit the unit, do they audit the records of the home hemodialysis patients as well? Yes, they do. And that's why it's so important for us to send in that evidence of our treatment because um, they want to see those flow sheets mm -hmm. and they want to see that we're doing our blood work on time and they want to see that, you know, that we're doing uh, the things that we're supposed to be doing to maintain our treatments at home. Mm -hmm. So they get the, the home dialysis department gets audited just like the uh, in center portion. Wow. So what would you what was what would you say to someone who lives in public? You said you had several friends that live in public housing that do home dialysis. Um, where do they keep their supplies because of the limited space? Well, now, um, home hemodialysis doesn't require as much supplies as peritoneal dialysis because you're hooking up to your sink. So you're already, you, your water supply is coming out of your faucet. 
So um, you have uh, you have less than half of the supplies that you need for peritoneal dialysis. I could say maybe I get about 10 to 12 boxes a month. So um, I, I have those boxes lined up down the hallway, um, you know, in, in my house. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have a spare room, everybody. You know, who has a spare room nowadays? You know, right. um, if you live in an apartment, if you have a corner in your room that you can stack your supplies up, then um, that's, you know, then that's sufficient. Can, can we take a look at your machine one more time for people who sure. may have just came in? Yep, here we go. There we go. There's the top portion. That's the cycler. Here's our water treatment. And inside this door here, this is the control panel. And that's my 60, 60 liters of sterile dialysate. And that water came right out of the tap in my bathroom. Oh, wow, it doesn't need a filter. It's in the back of the machine. So um, the sediment filter and all of that is installed in the machine. Wow. And yep. so that's that's the bath that cleans your blood. That's correct. Wow. And then again, here's our cartridge. This is what we use every time we're going to administer treatment. So you get a new dialyzer every time. Fresh, sterile patient line. Everything is color-coded. So all you're doing is matching up colors. There's your blue. That's Venus. Your Venus line. There's your red. And that's your arterial. Can you, can you hold the camera back a little bit? Okay, oh, there you go. Okay. Yep. And then... Um, the green, that's what hooks up to your dialysate. So that everything is color coded and you match up the colors and you screw the um you screw the lines in accordingly. So you don't even you don't you can't get it confused. Red goes with red. I mean unless you're colorblind. I guess that would be that may be uh that may be a problem. If you're colorblind, you probably wouldn't be a good candidate. Uh huh. Okay. Now, do someone come out to calibrate your machine, or you do your own calibrations? Yeah, no. Um. When that when this machine gets installed, um, you call customer service, and they tell you, uh, you know how to uh, how to set it up. It's it, it's not even it's nothing like what you what you you use at the dialysis center, Steve. Well, let me, let me just say this. Uh -huh. Do who does the maintenance on it? The PM, like the yearly checks, like because the machines wear down, you know, after so many hours. Right. So, does a technician from the facility come and just do like monthly or quarterly uh, preventive maintenance checks? No, um, we have an annual maintenance uh, maintenance check that we do. And um, there's, they send you what you need to do the maintenance, and you talk to them on the telephone, and and customer service walks through the whole process with you. Mm -hmm. And that's something, that's something that takes, um, you know, it, it it takes basically no time at all. Every couple of months, there is something in here called a pack that um that you change. About every three, about every three or four months. I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if I can show it to you. But this is um this is what hooks up to uh your sediment filter and everything. Um and, and that helps to process the water. I don't think you can see it good here. Right. But um every couple of months, uh, the machine will tell you it's time to change this. And you pull it out and you put another one in and you prime it and you're ready to make your next batch of dialysate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So th th 
these these machines are really designed to be patient friendly. What's in that box? Which box? Oh, here. Yeah, oh, yeah the the, the yeah, white so, one. Yeah, since I have you you guys on here, this is my um my epigen. Can we take a look at it? Oh, I didn't even open it. Yet. Oh, that's yeah. okay then. Yeah, but they send this to me from the Epo Depot. And um they they send it to you packed in ice and um and you store it in the refrigerator like you guys do at the dialysis center. And the small box here, this is my venifer. So they send you everything that you need, Steve. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I was saying this this box here is my venifer. Oh, okay. So, okay. I was trying to find my bag of medicines that I had to show people how the uh, medication looks like. Oh, yeah. So they come in a small vial. You know, um, let's see. I got I got a heparin here. Um, the, they, they supply me with the heparin that I need. Um, when I administer treatment, and then the epigen comes in in a vial like this, just smaller, two thousand milliliters. Um, uh, and a uh, venifer that comes in an even smaller bottle. So I give myself my own medications for for maintenance. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. So wow. you really you really become empowered. You're you're in charge of your own treatments. I'm telling you. Uh oh, do you have a separate refrigerator for your medicine? Okay. Looks like we may have lost Don, but that was that was great information. I'm sure she'll be back soon. But what she was talking about was the medication that she uses for hemodialysis. And I was trying to find the vials. Um, I had some samples to show you exactly how the EPO looked like. They're little small vials. And I think we got Dawn coming back on. Here we go. Thank you, Dawn, for, for coming back on. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's OK. That's OK. but. The, the, the question was, uh -huh. do you keep your medicine in a separate refrigerator? No, I keep my epigen in Ziploc bags and I have my own little shelf in the refrigerator that I um that I put my medicine on. So like you can keep your medicine maybe in the but in the butter in the butter drawer in the refrigerator. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But it stays in the Ziploc bags until I'm ready to use it. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of wrap, wrap it up a little. So, so the benefits with you had went over for home hemodialysis, just to recap, uh, you can do dialysis in the comfort and privacy of your own home, which you have uh, completely doing right now. It's yes. private and it's comfortable for you. Yes, it is. Wow. And, so if, and Steve, also patients um, are concerned about traveling. You know, when you go on vacation, you have to call and a facility has to accept you where you're going and, and you have to forward all of this, um, your, your, um, your, your blood work and all of this. And, and when, you know, when you're traveling, but when you travel and you're a home patient, you work, you talk to your nurse, let them know you're traveling and um, they ship your supplies to wherever you're going and you take your machine and go. Mm. Okay. And that was one of the benefits. Um, also, one benefit I want to touch on, you don't need to travel to the dialysis center every day. No, you uh, don't. You'll usually visit the clinic a couple of times a month to check in with your care team. How often do you check in? I go once a month to to clinic to see the physician, the nurse, the dietitian, and social worker all at one time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, 
you may have fewer diet limitations than other dialysis options. Oh, we didn't even get a chance to talk about that. Because I do my treatment so often, I'm less um I'm less restricted. Um I can I basically um eat according to my blood work. Um I I eat pretty much what I want. Uh, wow. As, as long as my labs, as long as my labs fall within normal range, then um I don't have any restrictions on my diet. Mm. So when you go in for that monthly visit, are you visiting with the whole care team, like your nurse, the dietitian, and the social worker and the physician? Right. Everybody's there mm -hmm. at, at one time. And they all come in and they review what they need to review with me. The dietitian will go over the labs with me and, um, you know, we'll talk about if there's anything that we need to discuss, we'll talk about that. Um, the social worker will ask me, how am I doing? Is there anything that I need? How am I feeling? Um, the nurse goes over all of the clinical aspects of administering the treatment and the doctor wraps it all up with a nice bow. Wow. Wow. Um. So you already mentioned this benefit. People can travel with their home hemodialysis machine. This right. can make vacations a lot easier. Absolutely. I, I remember one um, incident where we tried to set someone up treatment in Georgia at the last minute and it turned into a big disaster. But having your doing home hemo, you wouldn't even have to worry about facts in and having this blood work and that blood work and certain things prepared to fax because you got your own machine and you can do the treatment, go to the hotel or if you're staying in an Airbnb or wherever, you can do your treatment there. That's all you have to do is have the address to where you're going and you're responsible for taking like your band-aids and your needles and, you know, and things like that. But your saline and your um and your dialysate and all of that they send that over for you mm -hmm. yeah but even if you're driving as well that's oh, yeah that would be great steve i drove across country with my girlfriend um with my machine and we stopped at you know at different points we we planned before we left where we were gonna stop so i did dialysis in new orleans um, in Arizona, in in Texas, so wow. you know, it, it was it was fantastic. We drove from California to Florida. Wow, wow. Yeah, it was it was it was uh the one of the best trips of my life. Okay, now one of the last benefits: more frequent home treatments can remove excess fluid more gently. This is good for your heart and recovery time. That's right. Um, a lot of people, once they're done with their home hemo treatments, they get up, like I get up in the morning and I go to work or I go about my day. I don't have, after, after dialysis treatments, I don't have to sleep for four and five, five hours. You don't feel don't, sluggish? No. I don't feel sluggish. I don't cramp. And um, I don't have to go to sleep. What about, do you get any headaches? No. Mm-hmm. Wow. So this just seems, just talking with you, and if I had to go on dialysis, I would, home dialysis would be my first option because the type of, I mean, I know... We know this is not for everyone, right? And, but for for people who are active, that's working, this would seem to me would be the overall best choice to do. I I think so, especially if you want to be in control and you want to be responsible for your own treatment. And you want the convenience of doing your dialysis on your own schedule. And mm. like you said, if somebody's taking care of a sick parent, you know, you don't you, you don't want to spend your whole 
day in the dialysis center. You yeah. Know, it, it just gives you a lot of control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Especially if you have a parent that, you know, is kind of weak and, and you got to get them out the house and stuff like that. If you did the treatment at the house, come over and, and, and did a short treatment and leave or maybe had a caregiver. Because now I've seen companies um, pretty much, I don't want to say get away, but at one time they used to pay for nurses to do home hemo, but not anymore. But now what some companies have d done up here in Baltimore is, is instead of calling a CNA going into the home, they call them caregivers. So as long as you have a caregiver there with you, you can do home hemo. So someone could say, okay, we can pay someone maybe eight, nine dollars to be there and watch while the person is doing the home dialysis. Cause like you say, all you need is a caregiver. So that kind of changes the playing field. It's not a home hemodialysis technician where they have to abide by the state regulations now. Right. It, it's a caregiver. You see right. how they changed the name? And they change it, right? Because basically um, you, you need somebody to be uh, in the house. Mm -hmm. Because but, if you're if you're doing the treatment yourself, you're putting your own needles in. You're you're writing down your information on your flow sheet. You know, um, really, and 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 the likelihood of an emergency happening is minimal. But basically, you need all you need somebody in the house for is you know to um pass you the telephone if you need to call nine one one. You know, mm -hmm. But if your blood pressure starts to go down during treatment, you open up those uh you open up the saline line and give yourself a little saline and you know and you start feeling better. But I, I think that's really the um the biggest concern that I've had since I've been doing my treatments myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as we close out this education session. What would you leave, what takeaways would you leave from this education for someone who may be considering home dialysis, in fact, home hemodialysis? Uh, the, the, the main thing that I want to leave with patients is just the, the very thing that you think that you can do um, you can do it, um, and all you have to do is want to do it, and all you have to do is try. Um, that's the first thing. And secondly, if you if you don't like it, uh, or if you try it and you decide that it's not for you, then you still have your incentive treatments that you can you know that you can go back to. It's not like you're stuck forever. If I decide that I don't want to do this anymore, well, you know, they I'm sure they'd be happy to take me back in center. Mm -hmm. So, so the takeaway is that um it's empowering to do your own treatments. It's it's great to be the the one in charge and to be in control of your life. And um and and you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. And I tip my hat off to you, Don. You've been a real trooper warrior um, the years. Was it 28, almost 30 years doing this? Yes. Um, I'm on year number 27. Going wow. Going 28. Wow. Wow. I'm just I'm just fortunate that I met you. Um, you've been a blessing on our shows with your powerful information. And I mean, like I said, I, I think you should be doing something a lot more more greater than what you're doing. But I know that's in the Lord's time. But yes, I really. Is. Yeah, I really thank you for opening up your home, showing us your machine and your 
um, your daily routine of, of what you do to, you know, sustain your life on a, was it four or five day basis? Yeah. Four days a week, four mm -hmm. nights. Wow. And Steve, I just want to thank you so much for what you do. You know, you're such a blessing to so many people, you know, by taking the time out of your life to, um, you know, to educate patients so that we can make better choices and so that we can be aware and informed about, mm -hmm. you know, how to get the best out of our lives. Because, uh, you know, nobody asked to, to be on dialysis, you know, but we have to make the best out of what God gives us. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, and, and I think I just think this is such a great platform and a blessing to so many people. So thank you. Um, for your friendship and for your graciousness. Oh, absolutely, Don. Absolutely. And thank you for those kind words. I, I appreciate it. I'm just tired when I was working in the hospital. I was just tired of, of coming in two, three in the morning, you know, to do dialysis on someone. And then they said if they only knew, meaning if they knew, only knew that they had kidney disease instead of it finding out at the last moment. I can't tell you how many of those cases that I've, you know, had to deal with and, yeah. you know, very, uh, very sad and, and heartbreaking yeah. when you see that. So, again, thanks for being on the show. And, you know, we're going to bring you back because we definitely like to bring you back and talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, other topics. And, and one topic in Pacific that we're going to be talking and and in the near future is uh, compromised kidneys. All right. Well, I thank you again, and I, I'll be happy to come back anytime. We're going we're gonna to be friends till the end. Absolutely. All right, Don. Well, you have a good night. Thanks again, and God bless you. All right. Thanks. All right. Good night, everybody. Great. God thanks, bless. Don. Bye-bye. So, again, I'd like to thank Don P. Mormon from New York CKD Champions for coming on uh, Kidney Disease Education Moment. This was definitely a, a great show. I've seen a uh, lot of participation and that's what we want so we can spread awareness on kidney disease. That's what's gonna be kidney disease, not the yearly kidney walks and uh, raising money for the Kidney Foundation for research and all that, because if that was the case, how many years has these large organizations been in existence talking about research, but yet every year dialysis clinics are increasing as well as patients with kidney disease. That does not seem like any type of decline in clinics or um, diagnosis. So to me, I believe fundamentally the only way to deal with this disease is through education, prevention, and awareness. That's the only way, especially if it's due to preventable diseases like hypertension or diabetes type 2. No one has control over genetically if you're born with a condition that leads to kidney failure. However, with the preventable diseases such as diabetes and hypertension, which are the two leading causes of kidney failure, those are preventable. And that's what we have to tackle, those two things for those diseases to uh, de-escalate the cause of kidney failure. So join us next week as on Kidney Disease Education Moment where we're going to have on special guests, the Kidney Boys. And they're going to tell us how they started their group as a result of kidney disease. So we'll see you again next week, same time, same station, Urban Health Outreach Media. Until then, take care, God bless, and good night.